So, the next panel is uh, on Haudenosaunee nationhood. Um, so, Erin is a Gayen Bihaga Kente Wakata Yoni. I got the last one really wrong. It's Wolf. From wolf. Oh, fellow Wolf. Uh, from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. He's on the board of the Haudenosaunee Development Board. Um, he received his LLB from the University of Toronto and specializes in First Nations Aboriginal land claim litigation and negotiation. Um, so I'd like to start possibly with also um, with the territorial discussion in this sense, um, what your sense of your territory is. Is this Robert's water? I'm drink it. <laughs> he didn't drink any of it. It's so okay, even if he did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting because uh, when we talk about these issues, a lot of the discussions that when we start talking about territory, they end up uh, being unnecessarily divisive because of uh, some of the things that we talk about. And we didn't do a formal opening. We would normally do uh, what's called the Ahondo Gadawadekwa. We would go through an opening and we would talk about the different responsibilities that we have and we would talk about Onkoi Son'a, which would be the people, and Yonki Nistan'a, Yeti Nistan'a, Hunja, which is um, our mother of the earth. And those are really the primary, um, I guess, the, the primary um, factors that we consider when we start talking about relationships. And then this whole nationhood discussion really is a discussion about relationships. So one of them, we get down to this idea about territory. You, it necessarily starts to ask us questions about how we draw lines around different, uh, different areas or different properties or different places. And quite frankly, we've never really been about drawing lines and it runs um, uh, contrary to everything that we believe in to draw a line to say this is ours or this is yours and this is ours and this is because it undermines this idea that if we're going to be serious about our relationships with, uh, with our mother, the earth, that those relationships exist whether or not I sit on the left hand side or the right hand side of a fictional line. <laughs> But with that said, uh, <laughs> we like uh, the left side. No, uh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> with that said, it was interesting because we often, I often, when I speak in Toronto, I hear Toronto referred to Anishinaabek, uh, uh, Anishinaabek uh, territory, and while it is Anishinaabek territory, it is also Haudenosaunee territory, and <laughs> we're, but we're not trying to be divisive about it because it's both and I, I just got back from a, a day-long meeting with the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport and they're in charge of archaeology and one of the problems we're finding is with how they're doing archaeology and the interesting thing that we find is that when they look at the, the, uh, the archaeology you'll see what looks like a Anishinaabek village and then 20 feet down you will find what looks like a Haudenosaunee village and then in that or 10 meters down, in, in between that space you'll find another village site that has a little bit of both. And that's been the consistent history, um, and I'm going to suggest since time immemorial. There's not this specific us and them in terms of Onkwison um, or all the people, or we would say, we heard this Anishinaabek word apply to Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee word would also apply to Anishinaabek. And uh, we have this other word, Onkwe Onkwe, to des describe the people of Turtle Island. Uh, so that's a long-winded answer in terms of territory to say it's all of our territory and it's all of our responsibility. Um, Even though we have a treaty. <laughs> yeah, and I was wondering, um, in terms of uh, working for the Development Institute, can you just explain a little bit about that being the policy arm of and so, um, structure? So we have, a, in terms of this idea of nations, uh, the Haudenosaunee have a, a, a formalized structure by which they operate. And you, many have heard of it uh, described as the six nations, and some have uh, actually heard it described as the five nations. We do have six nations. The, the, the sixth nation is a, a recent addition to what's a political confederacy. And we, it's broken down into a very specific structure where you have something called the Older Brothers, and again, these are English translations, and that's the Mohawks and the Senecas. And they sit across, actually, in a legislative body. They actually have a legislative body uh, called the Longhouse, and they sit across from the Younger Brothers. And it, it's not meant to imply that one is senior or has more, they just have differing responsibilities from the, the Cayuga and the Oneida, uh, and uh, Bruce's Oneida, and then 
the body that sits in something of an executive position are the Onondagas. So a decision comes into the well, which is referred as the, the Mohawks, and they confer with their Seneca uh, brothers, and they tro toss it across the fire to the younger brothers. If they agree that it comes all the way back to the Mohawks and they have to agree or consider any add-ons, and once those two sides of the fire are in agreement on a particular issue, it gets sent to the Onondagas for ratification, essentially, and the Onondagas will review the discussion that took place. And this is a legal process because it's actually chiefs or royane who are making these decisions, and there's 50 of them. There's actually 50 chiefs representing uh, at least nine different clans uh, within the Confederacy. Um, and so what the chiefs did, and this sort of goes to the gentleman's point about this proactive thing, and I, I, really wanted to, I really wanted to address this issue. What the chiefs did is they, they sat down at a negotiation table with a, a termination table, and it was a, ter a termination table, um, and I was involved in that, and this, this was the negotiation that arose out of the Caledonia or Douglas Creek Estate, what we refer to as Gonestado. And so there was a six-year negotiation process that went on to try and start to resolve issues between us and the Crown. And what we had said to the Crown in those negotiations was, we do not have a relationship with Canada. We have these treaties with, with Great Britain, but we don't necessarily have a relationship with Canada because we haven't ever agreed that it's within the power of one of the treaty signatories to devolve their obligations to another party. Uh, and it's one thing for Great Britain to say, well, we're going to give all Canada all of the responsibilities under this treaty, but we're going to say to, to um, Great Britain, on what basis does the treaty allow to you, you to unilaterally do that? Because Canada is, quite frankly, a conflict of interest on everything they do in dealing with us. So we were trying to really formulate a go forward what, and try and structure what is our relationship uh, as the Haudenosaunee going to be with Canada as a nation. And it took some real internal work for us to even acknowledge Canada as a nation to sit down with them. Um, and then the Canada wanted to bring the province along. And we kind of looked at the province, but you know that's on their side of, of, uh, of what we call the two-row wampum. They can structure themselves as they see fit. And it became quite evident that Canada was retroactive in the means by which it sought to resolve issues. And when I say retroactive, they wanted to do more research. What does the research say about this particular surrender that happened in 1844, and how many signatories were to this particular document, and was the document written on parchment, or was it written on... on uh, <laughs> it, that's the way it went. And, and so it became this real retroactive exercise and then we said, well, what about our relationship going forward? It became quite clear, and you're going to hear later today, discussions about these termination tables. There was no discussion about how we're going to structure our relationship going forward because once we come to an agreement, that is supposed to end our relationship because you're going to effectively take some money and self-terminate your rights to the land. And it got to the point, this went on for six years, and we kept, trying to, we kept asking them, what are, we, what are we going to do about the relationship going forward? What are we going to do about the relationship going forward? And they could never come with a straight answer because they, they had an agenda. And one of our, they, they offered us $23 million for a piece of land that was flooded. And one of our older chiefs, the Arnie General, said, does that, uh, at the very end, they were, everybody was getting close. You know, we've got to be serious. If somebody puts $23 million in front of you, people start to take notice. One of our older chiefs said, so what happens to the land? It's still ours, right? And the, the federal negotiator said, no, 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 no. You, you're going you're gonna to have what's called a fallback non-assertion clause inserted into the agreement. And that's basically another way of saying a surrender. So that fell away. So it's a long-winded explanation, sorry, um, wanted to get up to the point of HDI because what happened was the chief said, we are no longer going to deal... Um, we are no longer going to address these issues reactively. Um, we're no longer going to address these issues after someone comes to us and says, we want to build uh, a gas power plant. We're not going to deal with these issues about, uh, uh, we want to run a, a, uh, the reversal of line nine. So what they did is they said, go out and set up a structure, an institutional, something that had a structural basis um, to deal with development within areas of what we call Haudenosaunee jurisdiction. And so it's a proactive step because what we did is we said that um, we really turned this whole consult and accommodate paradigm on its head. Uh, right now you'll hear a lot of stuff going on in, uh, out there in, with First Nations, and I'm going to use the word First Nations for the time being, I don't really even like that word, um, um, with the uh, Ongwe Ongwe Nations 
where the government would come and say, we're the government, we're gonna come and consult with you, First Nations, you Indian people, we, we might have an obligation to talk to you about this thing. And consultation can mean we, maybe we just talk to you, maybe we give you some meaningful input, maybe we let you go through an EA process. Well, you know what, we'll take your treaty rights issue and we'll turn it into an environmental issue. Even though your treaty rights are about a relationship between nations, we're gonna jam it into an environmental process. And once you agree to, to have your treaty rights addressed within the environmental process, we're gonna gut the environmental process. Um, <laughs> and it, it just didn't make any sense from the get-go. So what we said, well, if, these, if this rhetoric coming out of um, Ottawa is about nation to nation, then, and you're a nation, and we're a nation, well, our nation has a government, and our nation has a government that's been here for at least 60,000 years, uh, we have every right, we have every right, we have an equal right, and to some minds, we have a superior right, even though we don't like to get into hierarchies. <laughs> we have a right to regulate as a government by our laws, by our own laws, because we're not just cultural beings, we're legal beings. We have our own legal systems. We've always had them, and that's part of the, the, the way that we've intertwined with each other on Turtle Island is through these legal agreements. Our legal agreements actually are real legal agreements because they're by and large upheld by most of the indigenous populations. They stick with, you shake somebody's hand and you come to an agreement, it becomes a spiritual agreement as well as it becomes a legalistic agreement. So what we did is we went out and we started to regulate companies and they hated it. They absolutely hated it. Uh, they, they resisted, and, we said, and even in the terminology, so instead of saying that we were gonna take a consultation fee, we, we have a website by the way, which I'm supposed to plug because my web person here is, is Deanna here. She's going to be really mad that I'm making her stand, stand up. This is a no. Come on. She set up our web page. You can go talk to her about it afterwards. Okay. Okay. Um, it's www.hodenoshoneeconfederacy.com, and you can look it up online. And then there's a link that takes it to the Haudenosaunee Development Institute. And we the basis of uh, was sorry. H H A U D E N O S A U N E E. You are right. <laughs> um, so we actually make the companies apply to the Confederacy as a government through its regulatory arm, the HDI. We make them apply to us. And we had, no, um, we had no end of grief from companies saying, well, we don't really want to apply. We actually have an application form. It's on our website. If you want to do development within areas of Haudenosaunee jurisdiction, you're obligated to actually go out, fill out an application, send it to us. The application is going to have the historical uh, title information, your document, what kind of industry you're in, all the standard sort of application stuff. It's rather boring, actually. But it's the process of making them apply that they've resisted. They said to us, well, can't we just give you the $30,000 now? <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, you know, that's the amount that we've kind of, we've budgeted to, to <laughs> basically pay off the Indians. Like, it's, we got $30,000, we'll just, can't you just take it now? Uh, and we continually say, no, 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 you, you think you're talking to a band council. We're not a band council. We're not taking the money without going through a principled approach to what kind of development you're undertaking. Where is the development occurring? Is it consistent with the Haudenosaunee principles that we talked about? And we heard that they're not just Haudenosaunee principles, they're also Anishinaabek principles. Uh, we heard them this morning quite eloquently about um, what I wrote down as um, an e ecology of intimacies. And it was a really nice word. It really struck, struck me as a very powerful way of, of and I'm gonna steal it. Um, and it struck, Sorry, me as, yeah. it struck me as a really nice way of describing how all of our responsibilities are interrelated. And that's when you go to a development company and say, listen, I want you to explain to how, your, how your windmill is going to fit into my e ecology of intimacies. They, they may or may not get it, but I'm going to start using it now. So that's what, we're, uh, that's what we're working on. And we actually make them apply. We make them 
give us money and it's an application. We don't force them, we don't demand them, and contrary to what one judge said in Brantford, I have never threatened anyone. Uh, I have. <laughs> um, so we, that's, and, and uh, we had one company, Samsung, and I've seen some of the people here today who are a lot of our allies who came out with us and started and really worked with us to, to compel Samsung to, to take a good faith approach. Samsung wanted to give us the money, they just didn't want it to be called an application. Why don't you want to be called an application? Because we don't want to recognize that you have the ability to regulate. <laughs> so just take the money, just take the money. So that's, um, I'm sorry for that long, really long-winded answer to no, what insane. HDI is doing, but that's it. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could backstep a little in terms of possibly like a little bit of the history of how the, the, the trauma of the banned government's insertion and how um, in Six Nations you have your kind of traditional governance system and then you have the banned government system and how that kind of relationship is working, but also how it came about. Um, so I, I mentioned that the Confederacy government and that Confederacy government has been you know, ongoing for to my, we talk to some of the elders and they talk about stuff that happened 60,000 years ago. When they do their, um, when they have uh, condolences, they actually talk about stuff. And I, I said, no, come on, you can't, that can't be. And no, they actually go into great detail about some of the different animals that they talk about, the, the mammoths and the, uh, all that type of stuff. So they, they know it, they have that history. So for that 60,000 years, this was the government that was in place. And that government made a number of treaties with the British crown. When the British Crown was in danger of losing its monopolistic or its ability to undertake commercial enterprises in uh, North America. So when it was to the favor of the British to have the Haudenosaunee as allies, they signed treaties. And those treaties were, were the pre-confederation treaties, they're not surrender treaties, there's something in the nature of the Mi'kmaq uh, peace and friendship treaties, but they certainly don't talk about surrendering anything. So that government goes on for, for a significant period of time. A number of the Haudenosaunee assist the British in the American Revolution. They uh, relocate, and I use a re-word again, because they come up to the Grand River, but the Haudenosaunee were already on the Grand River. And there's something called the Haldeman Proclamation in the 1760s. Um, and the Haldeman Proclamation actually isn't a grant of land from the, the king to the Haudenosaunee. It was a further reinforcement of where settlers couldn't go. So six miles on each side of the Grand River, from its mouth to its head, you can't go there. And they're also given a, a significant amount of money. And this background will make sense in a second. So, in 1760, it's a million acres of land. So they had a million acres, their quote-unquote reserve uh, was a million acres of land. And what they did to raise money was they started to lease it. And by leasing it, I mean leasing it. They did not surrender it. There's no evidence of any surrenders. They started to lease the land to raise money. Um, <clears throat> most of Kitchener-Waterloo is... Haudenosaunee land, Fergus, Haudenosaunee land, Cambridge, Haudenosaunee land, Paris, Haudenosaunee land, Brantford, all leased to raise money to create an annual income. And, and it was actually the case that in terms of the Mississaugas, the Mississaugas were actually working very closely with the Haudenosaunee at that time and actually had Joseph Brandt assisting them to negotiate uh, these types of leases. And when the British found out about it, they banned Joseph Brandt from working with the, with the Mississaugas so that they could attempt to compel them to surrender their land in a fraudulent um, undertaking, which eventually happened. So all of this goes on. And finally, um, for the next 100 years, the British crown cheats, lies, and steals. So they cheat, lie, and steal until all the Haudenosaunee money is gone. They built um, Osgood Hall. The, the, they used it for Osgood Hall. They used it to build McGill uh, University. They used it to build many of the bridges in Burlington. Uh, there's something called the Welland uh, Canal uh, uh, Company they used to, they dumped the money. So even in 18, let's call it 1840 dollars, it's something in the range of, uh, we looked at at one time, 700,000 British uh, pounds on a couple of the claims and it works out to something like $5 billion dollars. Now, so that, that's only, at least, at a minimum, a number of the claims. So what happened was uh, a gentleman named Descahe, who was one of the Confederacy chiefs, he was a Cayuga chief, says, okay, we've had enough. They start hiring lawyers. They're like, what's going on? So Descahe then goes to Europe 
and starts talking to the European powers about the treatment that they're receiving from the British Crown. Canada, and they had a gentleman named Duncan Campbell Scott at the time, um, you know, <laughs> I obviously don't need to give too much of, so Duncan Campbell Scott is, is helping to um, orient, uh, uh, I'm going to call it Canada, it wasn't even Canada at that time, he starts orienting the policy, he says, listen, we can't let Descahe gain support from the Netherlands, we can't let him gain support from Germany, and it looks like they're sort of, he's starting to get traction on this, what are we going to do? Because this is, they have real legitimate claims. They have, there's no way you can look at these and say that somehow they're, um, there's some kind of historical problem with them. So what the Canadian government did at the time is they decided to use some of the internal discontent that was going on at Six Nations. And the internal discontent that was going on at Six Nations at the time was part of the discourse and part of the way that that community was evolving. And I don't even like to call it discourse because it was no more or no less than goes on in any other community or any other polity. It wasn't like there was something special about um, the nature of the, uh, of, of the disagreements that were going on as the Six Nations community was trying really to work through how it was going to transform itself into uh, in its governance structures from what was broadly started off as harvesting, hunting and gathering, and then with a strong commercial, uh, the fur trade, they came to Six Nations, they amended their, uh, their, their economy, became a bit more of a farming economy, and so there was an adjustment there. They were just starting to adjust to um, an industrial economy, and so what the Canadian government is, they used some of those forces that were there to basically bring in an elected system under the Indian Act. And this happened not only in Six Nations, but it happened also in um, Tainanaga, it happened in Akwesasne, somebody was killed in Akwesasne, it happened in Ganawagi. Most of the Haudenosaunee communities, they actually had to get the, the, the RCMP, and there's a woman who ta talks about it when they came in on the horses. So they came in, they literally came into the council, and they, they had a council house, they came into the council and they started beating people, pistol whipping people, and beating them down, and they stole all of their wampum that they, were, they used to um, officiate their, their, their government, and they passed an order of council to say you don't exist anymore. We're gonna have a new system because, and, and one of the, the great lines, um, they have this, there's, I think it's called the Hawthorne Report, that they used to justify this, and they said, there is an unusual and unnecessary, unnecessary influence in the politics of this community undertaking by what appear to be old women. <laughs> and, and that's the, that was one of the, the foundations. So if I think it's really important that we have in this discussion about I don't know more and about women and how women are leading it and how women are behind it because it was so difficult for the government in 1924 to wrap its head around how women really were the political leaders. They were the political foundation. They get to appoint the chiefs. Um, so that was one of the justifications. So they took out the traditional chiefs in 1923 at gunpoint, and they implemented the band council system. And in order to justify the band council system, they had to have a vote. So, and this is the, the thing about nationhood that we, the first vote was nine people. Nine people. And to this day, that elected band council believes that it's justified in what it's doing because it has the modern day equivalent of nine people voting. I think something in the range of 1,100 or 1,200 people voted, uh, but Six Nations is something in the range of 25,000 people. So we still have this very disproportionate number of people who do not support the elected band council system. And they do not support the elected band council system because it's undemocratic. And undemocratic structures give rise to undemocratic decisions. And this idea of democracy and this idea of nationhood, where you get to practice or you get to undertake a democratic lifestyle or you get, to, you get to express yourself, you get to identify once every four years and then you call that democracy, that's what I find um, offensive. I find it extremely offensive that uh, they want to impose upon the Haudenosaunee a system where I'm only allowed to be democratic once every four years. Uh, and this decision, this issue came up even in the Canadian system. And this is the question about about I don't know if one is going to ask me about how we relate to the to the Canadian system. But under the assimilation uh, assimilative process, why would I want to move from a system where I can engage in participatory democracy 
every second of every hour of every day of my life. I can participate in democracy. I can speak to my clan mothers. I can speak to my chiefs. I can speak to members of my family. We can come to decisions. We speak to the people who are decision makers. They listen to what we have to say. Why would I ever want to move to a process where once every four years I get to vote? And even where I vote, and this is what really galled me about, about I, I was not going to pronounce his name either, but when Harper <laughs> came out after, after, um, <laughs> after, after President Chavez died, he came out, he made this horrible comment, it just, not only a bad comment, but just tactless, no taste, um, about how maybe now there can be some advance of democratic ideals in Venezuela, now that Chavez is gone. But if you look back at the Harper record, he's trying to rule this country in a fascist manner with 36% of the vote. Criticizing Harper is like, it's the low-hanging fruit here. <laughs> we hit a lull, I'm just gonna go for the throat. Um, and I went back and I looked at the election and some of you I've tweeted with have seen this. Um, in terms of the popular vote, Chavez got something in the range of 51 or 52% of the popular vote. In the Canadian federal election, the way that this first past the post system is set up, it's not me. Not me either. Um, this first past the post system, they only got 35, 36% of the vote. How is that democratic that somebody who gets 36% of the vote gets to control every single message that every single department all across the country gets to say? Like if somebody from Oceans and Fisheries in Nunavut wants to issue a press release on the spawning of the herring, or whatever it is, and how it's being impacted by ice flows, that information's got to go back to the PMO. The PMO's got to review it. Is it consistent with our messaging in and around what we want to say about ABC? Then it goes back and they decide whether that person can talk or not. That's not democracy. I don't know what that is. Um, so anyways, that's, my, that's how the Six Nations elected uh, council came to be. Uh, the chiefs are still there. The chiefs still meet, um, they probably have a broad base, they have a, a significant broad base support not only in Six Nations but across all of the Haudenosaunee territories. I'm going to take a question from you so you can actually sit down at some point during this talk. <laughs> Can you dive into the mic? Sorry. Oh. Oh, it's not on. Sorry, honey. Technical difficulties. How's that? There we go. Okay, so I'll start over. My name is Nicola Rassan, and I'm from Colonize North America.com. And the reason why we're standing here today, even for heart career, blaming Harper for everything and pointing fingers. The real reason why we're here and everything's happening to the nations across Canada is because of the one world federal government coming in. And this is all dealt within the world trade system and the corporations. Now my question to uh, Aaron is that uh, we all know that Bank Council is also uh, at odds if they're trying to play the nation to nation with the government. And uh, because basically they are employees of the Kremlin. So what happens with the Haudenosaunee Council, the traditional council, and how are you going to, uh, how to say, deal with these corporations that you've been approached with? Um, because we have other nations like the EU who are trying to uh, reestablish their hereditary council so that they can stand up and walk away from because really, with, you know, as long as we've got bank councils and there's an attachment to the crown, uh, nothing is ever going to be really generated until there's a disconnect and standing up as your own nation and then completely politically decolonizing, which is actually a divorce from the crown and the paternal, uh, paternalistic uh, demands that the government makes on you. 
So okay. How is the Haudenosaunee Council going to deal with the corporations? Do they have to incorporate and still deal that way, or will get that honor? Okay. But so I, you, you've, there's a lot of questions there. I'll try to get to a couple, couple of them, and I just want to say, I thank you for the question, and I want to say that I, I disagree with sort of some of the underlying stuff that you've, you've put in, into your comment and question, and I agree with it. Um, but I want to look at, I want to step back a little bit for a second and part of the discussion we're undertaking today, because this issue of the other, and we heard it uh, earlier today when we were talking about what's, what does sovereignty mean? And I know this is a bit of an abstract answer, but I'll get more specific. What are the words, how do we say sovereignty in the Anishinaabek, or how do we say sovereignty in terms of Haudenosaunee? And there's difficulties with those words because they necessarily imply that you're attempting to define yourself and define your existence because of somebody else that is there. Uh, and so when you say sovereign, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to set up a political structure or a system where I get to define myself as opposed to you. I am this, you are that. Uh, and when we go back to what we talk about in the Ahanogali Wadekwa, we talk about in when we heard the Anishinaabek word for what it means, it means you're a human being. We have these responsibilities to each other and to um, everyone, to everyone. So we're, I'm not prepared to start that discussion necessarily about what are we going to do about them because they are us. Um, and it's, it might not quite resonate in terms of what we heard earlier, but like what are we going to do? Are we going to start marching across the street? Are we going to shut down their office? Uh, because I think when you get into doing that type of thing about dealing with them specifically and directly, you, what you do is you corrupt yourself internally and you corrupt your ideals and you corrupt your principles and you can't help but do it. I'm not saying anyone's doing it, uh, anyone's doing it uh, intentionally, but this is the problem of also people who, and I've done it from time to time, I'm going to go work in the system. I'm going to go work in the bank council system. I think I can change it because these, the structures dictate outcomes. So that's a long-winded back uh, drop to say, what are we going to do about um, our stuff? We're going to do our things. And when we do our things based upon our principles and based upon our relationships, we get good outcomes. We can focus our energy and our time on bank councils or the Canadian government or Harper, and I'm, I, I'll throw a dig in there, but I don't spend a lot of my time thinking or worrying about Harper because when I talk to my chiefs and my elders, He's a whisper on the back of a butterfly wing. It, he's almost, he's not that significant in the terms of when they start talking about their 60,000 year existence, what they continually say is, are you still doing things based upon the principled approach that we've set out? And by that principled approach, we have the Ahanu Gali Wadekwa, we have our, uh, the Gainlak Goa, the Great Law. We'd use those as time. We have earlier stuff, we have our ceremonies. Uh, and you know, the different indigenous people have their different ceremonies, but we test our interactions with developers and corporations against our ceremonies. How does this fit with our ceremonial uh, and our spiritual substrate, I'll call it? Because it's not that these things that, this HDI thing that we have now, it's not simply um, something that is independent and sits on its own. It sits on top of all of these 60,000 years of uh, spiritual relationships, medicines, uh, governance, law, and then we put it on top of it, and that's how we deal with it. Um, I, I, I know that might be too vague of an answer, but at the end of the day, I think um, we recognize who they are. We really consider them to be a, a kind of a dog nipping at our heels, and every once in a while, as we run forward, we will take the time and energy out to, well, I don't want to say, I don't like hurting dogs. I was going to say, we're going to give, give them a kick in the <laughs> teeth, but um, we do turn around once in a while to address it, but our focus is going forward uh, more than it is looking backwards. Uh, we have a question from online, and um, possibly you can answer it. What are your thoughts on the Kiwaden decision and what are some options for our people going forward? It's kind of a large question. But. Uh, the Kiwaden decision, it deals with the Whiskey Jack Forest. And uh, for those who aren't aware of it, uh, they won a substantial victory at uh, 
uh, the trial level. And basically what they said is because this treaty was between, at some level between the Anishinaabek and the federal crown, that the provincial crown didn't really have a place in undertaking activities that would significantly impair uh, uh, the treaty rights of the indigenous people. So I went to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal basically said, the Ontario Court of Appeal said that Ontario does have the right uh, to, it's called taking up lands or taking up, it's actually, it's specific to this treaty because there's actual taking up language in the treaty. But it, the argument was who can do the taking up? It is, the, is it the feds or is it the province? And the, basically it really would have tied the hands of Ontario and made them come to the table in a meaningful way and would have addressed this nation to nation issue. The Ontario uh, Court of Appeal has undone it. They've sort of re, um, they've sort of uh, endorsed the situation that was there beforehand. I think it's a, um, it's an un, it's an unfortunate that the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, they had the opportunity to start to revisit some of these relationships issues and they didn't do it in a meaningful way. They really sort of fell back on this consult and accommodate paradigm, which I don't think gets anybody anywhere. It's not going to solve these issues. And in terms of what people can do, uh, everyone everyone has their um, their own standard of of action. Some people call it direct action. Um, some people call it um, just action, and some people call it thinking and or talking. And uh, you know, talking is still direct action. Um, so I would just encourage everyone who who is interested in, in it to learn a little bit more about it and learn what it means. And I would encourage everyone online and here today. Perhaps one of the best things we can learn from this exercise is that we may never ever want to say the word consult again. <laughs> never. Like, that's it. We're not talking about that anymore. We're talking about jurisdiction. We're talking about, so if someone ever says, we want to consult with you, you can say, uh, no, you can engage with me. Uh, we can have a discussion. We can have a relationship. But I'm not going to empower you by using that word consult. <laughs> So um, I think you have a question as well, but can you please come down to the mic for it? Um, is any, if anyone has mobility issues and you can't get to the mic, but you'd still like to ask a question, please just wave your hand because we'll have somebody run the mic to you, okay? I think. There you go. Um, I'm kind of confused. I'm not very good at words. But uh, if I don't get carried to the court, but as I treat not with the Crown supposed to Canada, okay, not carrying, so how does Ontario have leverage on us? Um, what Canada will say is Canada will say that in 1867 it carved up its responsibilities and they said Indians and lands reserved for Indians is section 9124. And there's another whole host of constitutional responsibilities that fall um, to the province, including uh, uh, civil rights and, and, and property, all of which the, and this is just sort of standard legal stuff, all of which the province is supposed to exercise subject to section 109 of the constitution, uh, which sets out the existing trust which may exist on the land. That's one of the interpretations. That's how, that's how Canada and Ontario look at it. Well, earlier in the dialogue, Well, Canada invited the promises, but that's Canada, they can do what they want, that's not. They can't have to do with us. Well, different, yeah. yeah, different, yeah, we're not. Different nations have different treaty relationships with the Crown. So I think that's one of the things we have to identify. There's, there's a, a wide variety of relationships that exist across what is re commonly referred to as Canada. In the Haudenosaunee context, we don't have treaties with Canada. Um, the treaties that the Haudenosaunee have are with Great Britain. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Even We're going to have an internal discussion. What happens if, 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 Scot yes, the Mohawk. if Scotland secedes from Great yes, Britain? The Mohawk have the, uh, oh, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to drag me down a road I don't want to go. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am, and okay. I'm not going there. So, <laughs> so, um, so basically, one more question, okay. One yeah, quick more so question is other people. Other question is basically you're saying that Ontario does have jurisdiction over us here. 
That's what Ontario's Court of Appeal is saying, yes. Okay, um, we have one more question from online. Uh, thanks for organizing this, so I guess I, thanks. <laughs> uh, just wondering what the Haudenosaunee's position is on Enbridge's Line 9 reversal. That's a good question, and first of all, I am not the Haudenosaunee. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to make that clear, and again, just to say that I'm just one person. I do work uh, with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council, um, and I, it, that's out of Six Nations, but also, as diverse as um, all of the First Nations, quote unquote, are across Canada, the Haudenosaunee are a pretty diverse group too. So I think I just want to acknowledge and, and um, make that comment, respect everyone out here, because we are different people. Um, back to the line nine, we've had a real struggle with respect to what's been going on with the reversal of line nine right now, because we have a significant number, and I'm gonna use the word allies, and there's a whole big discourse around using that word allies, and, and I took my glasses off so I can't see anybody squinting at me and going, Ur. Uh, but we've had a long, we have a good relationship with a number of the groups that are opposed to Line 9. And they're opposed to Line 9 for environmental reasons, or they're opposed to line, the reversal of Line 9 because of uh, the tar sands issue, because of the threats to the water. There's another, you know, with reversal of Line 9, you can really just pick any of the above. But with that said, when the Chiefs set up the HDI, they set us up as a regulatory body. So they set us up to go out and look at projects. So it's very difficult for us to take a position on Line 9 until we do what we, we expect um, our partners to do, to take a good faith, meaningful, thoughtful, and rational approach to looking at this Line 9. Um, and, and so we're not necessarily in a position to come out and say we're against Line 9, because we haven't been afforded the opportunity to review it. What we will say is that we don't believe that line nine, if the reversal went ahead, and if we don't participate, but we've actually applied for uh, the National Energy Board, we're gonna be participating. What we would say is that if they don't give us the opportunity to exercise our regulatory um, obligations, that that line would be functioning um, illegally. And so that's the, and we take it very seriously. We say it would be illegal um, to do it. And, and people then ask us, where's the police force? And we say we don't have one except for the creator. Hmm. Thank you. Um, this will be the, is, uh, sorry, just one sec. Is Bruce here yet? No. Still no Bruce, eh? Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Cousin Johnny also. My question is, um, why are we entering into the court system with our um, agreements to the land when it's quite simple when you really start thinking about it, is that we never gave up possession or stewardship to the land in which we hold dear to us. We go into the court and we talk about the Canadian Constitution and their constitutional laws. Well, their constitutional laws don't hold any ground in uh, international level because they may have one written up, but is it really a binding document? And when you start looking at the original people, and I'm not calling us aboriginals, because we're not aboriginals, we're the originals. And with that in mind, I would like to know that we never gave up our constitution to be stewards to protect this land. So therefore, that constitution, to my, to my knowledge, still is binding and probably one of the oldest in, in the world. So when Canada goes into their courts and they use their constitutional laws to come back at us and try and take and rape, pillage our lands, I kind of wonder, uh, why are we allowing them to do that? Because to, to my knowledge, last February 2012, Canada took their constitution to the UN to, to have it accepted as their constitution for this, this uh, body of land that is called Canada. Well, this body of land that is called Canada is not a country unless you have a constitution. The UN refused to, to acknowledge 
that constitution because they didn't have proof that they owned the land. So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it in two ways and and I'm gonna use Latin to do it, unfortunately. But <laughs> yeah. all goes back to Rome. I know that's that's where their constitution comes from, quite frankly. I had a I had a good discussion about with somebody about uh, uh, we could get into the doctrine of discovery, we could get into papal bulls, we could have a, we could have a, a four hour discussion that would put a lot of people to sleep. Um, <laughs> but I I agree with you. Here's two things. I think why are we going to court, and what about the Canadian Constitution? I it's my position that. The, whether or not we agree about the foundations upon which the Canadian Constitution is built, or whether or not we agree whether it's a legitimate document in the face of um, our pre-existence here and our legal structures and our legal orders, it's out there operating. It's out there, it's operating, it's impacting us. Um, Canada is, I hear a lot of this, um, and Debbie probably agree, like people will say Canada is not a country. But Canada is recognized as a country by other countries. So they've set up this wonderful little system where they all recognize each other and they all get away with all kinds of things based upon this, this you know, the Treaty of Westphalia or the Westphalian system. So, yes, I, I agree with you that, it, that there are significant problems conceptually with that and whether they're legitimate, but we still have to deal with them because they're there. So that's the first part. Just because we deal with them and we want to find a relationship going forward doesn't mean we necessarily endorse them or endorse that constitution or endorse uh, their opp oppression. But we have higher obligations, and this is what the, uh, the elders and the chief talked to us about. Our treaty obligations are spiritual. We can't simply walk away from our relationship with other people. We can't walk away from our relationships. And this is something that plays out at these negotiation tables that I'm at. We've tried to restructure them. Our negotiation process is, is now, we're not asking the Crown for anything. We're not asking the Crown for money. We're not asking the Crown for recognition. We're not asking the Crown for land. We're telling the Crown, we're here to help you. Here are all the things that we're gonna go do. We're gonna go get our land back. We're gonna build our economies. We're gonna take care of our children and our elders. We're gonna respect our women. And we're going to continue to do these things, whether no matter what you say. And you know, you've seen some of these um, these things take place up close and personal. So, Crown, if you have a problem with any of this, we'll try to help you. We'll explain it to you. But we're not asking you for permission. Well, when we do go in, of course, we do. Um, so, so the, here's the sec here's the second part. I'll just get to it in a sec. Uh, HDI, the Haudenosaunee, and the Chiefs. Uh, don't go to court. We've gone to court once only because they tried to drag us into court and we went to defend ourselves to explain. We didn't what's called a tour into the jurisdiction. All we did was say, we're going to go here to try and explain the process, Your Honor, so you can understand it. But we don't believe you necessarily have jurisdiction. And on these indigenous, uh, sort of in terms of this I don't know more movement, one of the things I think that's important about I don't know more is it's a rejection. And this is me as a lawyer. It's a rejection and a legitimate and valid rejection of lawyers in the court system as being a solution to the problems that confront indigenous people. For too long, they've listened to lawyers and they've gone to courts and all that that effectively does is A, it depowers the people, it limits their access, it creates another hierarchical structure and you're taking your issues out of your own hands. Most indigenous people are rational beings. They're rational, pragmatic beings who signed these treaty agreements that said, we're gonna sit down and solve this with you. We're not gonna defer it over here to a third party to resolve because as soon as I send my issue over to a third party, it means I'm somehow not smart enough to figure it out with you. And if you're a rational being and if you're a thoughtful person and if you have some thought, the two of us can talk about it till we find a solution. And that's really what, where, what this court system does, is it undermines our commitment to each other. And that's one of the reasons that I, I as, even as a lawyer, I don't think that's a place you go to solve these issues. Well, my, Thanks my, so my much. Is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to cut you off. <laughs> um, you got your questions in there, but I can't have the response. Okay, well, I support, I don't know more, and it's, it's not about just, uh, you know, the uh, indigenous people of this land, it's about all human races. And you do have a responsibility no matter what color your skin is. 
to become a steward and protector of this land. Thank you. Yo. So I'd like to thank Aaron very much for doing the long conversation and then holding it on really well. Thanks, everyone, and thanks again to Wanda. Amazing job organizing.